right, everybody. Uh, hello, welcome to uh, Level Up with Jean Marie, a podcast that is talking about raising your spirituality, raising your vibration to uh, higher levels of consciousness, however that may look. And uh, today I'm joined by my lovely good friend and colleague, Nigel. Nigel Patterson has been a friend of mine for, gosh, Nigel, I think it's like eight, nine years we met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that in San Francisco. And um, since then, we've worked together on a couple of things. He's come to Kauai and we did some fun projects and helped you promote your book. And I um, will let you do the rest of the intro, Nigel. Why don't you just tell everyone about yourself? Well, we, we actually met 12 years ago. I'm thinking oh my that. God, 12. I know. Can you believe it? That's uh, so it would have been in 2013, 11, yeah, 2013, I think we met. Wow. Yeah, in San Francisco. Yeah. So well, hi, everyone, and thank you, um, Jean Marie, for the invitation to be here. It's lovely to see you again after all this time. <laughs> and you say we met in Hawaii. I was on the Big Island at the time, um, having traveled there a circuitous route around the world from Tanzania, then South Africa, then Australia, then San Francisco, then Miami, and then Hawaii, living different places and now living in Mexico. Um, we've been here for the last, gosh, three and a half, coming up for four years almost. Uh, and just enjoying life and allowing life to take us where we're meant to go. And I think that's part of the great adventure at the moment and how technology has enabled that. And we can just just follow, just go. Yeah, so, so my background, by the way, is of engineering. So I have an engineering background, electrical engineering, going back many years ago. And mm -hmm. then um, executive director of a large corporation, and then decided that was enough of that. Then um, had my own internet company, eventually sold that. And then, gosh, in 2008, I can't remember how many years ago that is, got involved in transpersonal counseling. But then that allowed me to incorporate all the stuff I'd been doing on the woo-woo side of life um, <laughs> for the previous 10 years. So I've been on the, let's call it the woo-woo path for about 30, 35 years now and loving it. Because that's where meaning seems to be found, not in corporate, behind corporate desks. You could probably relate to a lot of people that are feeling very similar. Uh, there's a lot of people that I've encountered over the years. And it's funny in the spiritual realm, too, that have started in um, engineering or some kind of more technical background and then realize uh, this isn't where it's at and then they awaken into some spiritual realm that is more gratifying for them what i really enjoy is that the technical background gives very good discipline in problem solving and logical thinking so it does for me it grounded me very much in those areas so when the journey into the or the spiritual or who we really are started I wasn't completely adrift. I had, you know, good grounding and therefore asking the hard questions. Why, what, prove it. Where's the proof? Show me this. Don't just take it for, for granted. And as far as I'm concerned, our guides and teachers and healers and spirit, they have to do the work as well. They have to deliver. They have to let us know they're here. We just don't take it for granted. You know, we can't just have this concept Oh, well, my guides are here. Okay, well, who are your guides? Prove, show me why you're here. Don't just expect me to believe that. So I think my skepticism through my technical background helped a lot. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it, it, I find that um, anyone on their spiritual path, once they start asking the questions, that, that's, that's the path, right? So ask questions and uh, spirit will show you one way or another. So on that, I'm curious to know how your relationship in the dolphin community developed, that that is where that connection for you comes in and the water and the dolphin and the cretaceans, things like that. 
Well, I have many stories of how that happened. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the, the biggest ones was probably the near death experience that I had where um, I was in the water swimming with dolphins mm -hmm. and doing what I love and following them. And I'm a pretty good swimmer. I've swam for a long time and we were out on the boat in the middle of the ocean. This was on the big island. And uh, I started going further and further out to sea. Mm. And because I had this connection with the dolphins, have you ever swam with the dolphins, Nigel? Mm. Yeah. Mm. So have you ever felt like this vortex of energy that surrounds them, that kind of you're in this alternate state of consciousness with the dolphins and you know I find people are more plugged in with that than I am I have mm -hmm. an, I have other areas which draw me more but um I absolutely recognize and honor that a lot of people are drawn to the dolphins and having facilitated a whole Hawaiian dolphin initiative on the big island a few years ago I understand how important that is to many many people and that that connection is very real. It's not a made up connection. It's absolutely real. It's absolutely present. And it's absolutely important. I got yes. That. Well, when I was swimming with the dolphins, uh, and maybe, you know, it's because the dolphins just opened my heart. And mm. I was in such joy and such bliss that I was in this alternate state. And I felt like this um, pull and connection to them and like I felt like one of the pod like mm. I was swimming with them and somehow I was able to keep up with them you know often swim a lot faster than humans but somehow either you know whatever I was with them swimming along and um what happened was <laughs> my mind came in and I uh started worrying because I was realizing that I'm traveling farther and farther out to sea. We're in the middle of the ocean where I couldn't even see the shore. Mm. And the boat, I was getting farther and farther away from the boat. Uh, but I know from swimming with the dolphins in the past that when you break that connection with the dolphins, they're gone. They're like, that's it. You know, you can't even find them. They're just... and. And they're like in this dimension and then they're in another dimension. You know, mm -hmm. I did not want to risk breaking that connection with them. Right. So there was a point where I was in a state of bliss and in a state of panic at the same time because I was in such joy doing what I love. Here I am being with the dolphins. And then I was panicked because the other side of my brain was the logical side was thinking, oh my God. I'm farther out to sea. I'm drifting away. Wait, you know, I don't even know where the boat is. And um, yeah, panic. And then what happened? Well, if you ever, you know, I had a mask fin and snorkel. So my head was in the water and I'm looking. And, and if you ever had that, if you ever panicked while having a snorkel, it's like you're hyperventilating, right? You're like... <laughs> Yeah. And just like, so I literally had a full body panic attack, like, you know, sweating, panicking. And, and you know, I started thinking about my kids and my family and, and, and um, you know, am I going to die out here? Hmm. And um, so through that panic attack, uh, all of a sudden I started seeing visions of my life. And I looked, I started seeing points where I let fear hold me back from being authentic, from being, from speaking my truth, from taking risks, from, you know, not experiencing. So all these different experiences popped up in my consciousness and like, you know, oh yeah. That, and, and um, I'm, Feel with the help of the dolphins, I just got to this place where I said, the heck with it, screw it. If I'm going to die, if this is how I am meant to die out here in the ocean with the dolphins, then so be it. And 
soon as I said that, and as soon as I came to that place, this immense calm came over me. And this peace, and uh, I felt this weight lifted off me. And I finally felt ready to look at where the boat was and say, okay, I'm gonna check and see where where I am <laughs> in the ocean, in this vast, vast ocean. So I finally come up to the surface. Now you're in the water, right? You don't know which direction is north, south, east, west. You're mm -hmm. just like all over the place. And I come out of the water and I look to my left and the boat was 20 feet away from me. Wow. And, you know, I didn't understand how that could happen because I was swimming in the water for quite a long time. I finally get up on the boat and I'm like shaking and still broken up. And um, this woman said that I saw you with the dolphins and you went out to sea and they turned you around and they brought you back to the boat. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. And when that happened, it made me realize like all those things, like what are we worried about? Really? I mean, it's like God has this in its hand. We're secure. We're safe. We're protected. And just to surrender and trust. And um, from that moment, my whole life had shifted. I came into being more my true self, speaking my truth and speaking up. And, and that's when I, I quit, decided to quit teaching and, and come into the healing arts. I first learned Reiki and then um, through Reiki connected again with the dolphins where dolphins started showing up in my Reiki sessions and then opened a healing center. So it was a huge transformation for me, a huge shift. What were you teaching before? <laughs> I was teaching high school math. Okay. So let's I mean, so talk about you, the engineering. I had that yeah. too. And I actually started off as an electrical engineer. Very cool. I went to school. So, so, so in other words, you still are teaching. Instead of math, you're teaching grace. But you're still yes. teaching. Yes, I'm still teaching. Yes, I come from a family of teachers. We're yeah. just, it's just who we are. And and. Yeah, and, and I think I think when we honor the skill or the gift that we come in with, we may change from math to grace, but the skill is, is always there, and for us to honor it and reframe it so it becomes a positive as opposed to a "I wish I could get out of this" energy. Right, and I, I think you know when I look back at my life. Like everything in my life was preparing me for this journey that I am on now. I feel like I'm more authentic than I've ever been. I'm more true to who I really am. And um, I'm able to embrace that. So today I was having lunch with a friend of mine, a young lady, and the word kuleana came up. I brought it up. Yes. You being living in Hawaii, do you want to share like what that means to you, Kuleana? Because I shared it with her. She yes, yeah. Well, the Kuleana, you know, that that's your truth. You know, the Kuleana is, you know, your gifts. What's your, what's your, um, your specialty? Your your, I feel like it's your gift that everyone is born with certain gifts and certain attributes, and. Um, the kuleana is a thing where it's just comes naturally to you. You know, it's a effortless. And that's a one part of it. And the other part? What would you say the other part is? Is that I love that word or that concept put into one word that when we identify and recognize our gifts or our purpose, we then have both a duty and a responsibility to fulfill that gift or purpose. Without that, we have wasted our journey on the planet. Mm, yes. So here you are fulfilling your, well, Kuleana is the fulfillment of that purpose that you're doing. It's because you've, you've it's actually- It's funny because you never feel like you fulfilled it. 
it's always there's always more to do and more to to share or to help you know, you know well you say at least you're saying you've never fulfilled it uh, you'd be surprised at how many people are too afraid of even starting the journey of fulfillment mm -hmm. yes and i think that's you know where these kind of podcasts of you talking about raising consciousness is how do we step into that place of fulfilling our kuleana where we recognize we're always given signs I think most of us are slapped very hard before we wake up to the sign. And I was right. you, nearly, you nearly drowned. I, I kind of nearly shot my brains out. And But we wake up. But when we wake up, it's that, that gift, that grace we're given is in how do we fully embrace that and not say, oh, well, thank goodness I got out of that one. I'm okay now. Let me carry on being this idiot. And um, So I yeah. want to hear how you uh, found your kuleana. And almost yeah. what did you say? Shoot your brains out. So as I said, I I have a BSc electrical engineering behind me, and so I was very much in that world. And um, in my mid thirties is when I came out as a gay man, but I was completely in the closet, living in South Africa at the time, because it was dangerous. It was under apartheid, and I could have been arrested and incarcerated had I come out. So luckily, I didn't have a black skin, so I could at least hide that. Whereas apartheid, you know, different color of skin get into trouble. So I managed to hide it until it is a certain point where one needs to be authentic. You can't keep on hiding because the inner spirit just keeps on wanting to break free, come through because this is who we are. And so that led to an incredible ungraceful performance in this large corporation I was the director of. And so basically, I, they had to fire me for being an idiot, for being an asshole. And that was a bit, um, bit of an ego dent. But in that, I really felt sorry for myself. And that was because I defined myself by the success at age 35 in the corporate world and everything that stood for and all the material trappings that came with, which are quite substantial at the time. But it was all taken away, all gone. Everything just disappeared in the space of a week, two weeks. But then a business associate from the U.S., um, reached out and said, what the heck's going on here? And he initiated, let's say, a correction from that, um, that termination from the corporation, because it was actually unfair dismissal, basically. I didn't even know what that meant at the time. And um, so from that moment is when my spiritual journey really began, because everything I dreamt of, which was having my own business, with a, a highly um, professional team by the coast, um, that, that all just manifested. And I had a choice then. I could either give the middle finger to the corporate company, which fired me and said, look, I can do this without you, go and stick it. But something said, Nigel, no, that's not the right way of doing it. Something far, far bigger than you or you could ever dream of manifested here because you asked for it, but you had to be got out of your way for this to be able to happen. And I was constantly in my way. My ego was in my way. My fear of coming out was in my way. The fear of judgment, the fear of being criticized by others, the fear of being possibly incarcerated was completely in the way the whole time. So that had to be shredded right down. And it was when I say that my only option then was to go bang, but even that didn't have the courage for that. Um, had, the, had South Africa had the same gun culture at the time as the US has today, that would have been a lot easier. But um, gun was locked away in a safe in another part of the country, so that wasn't going to happen. Um, so that's kind of how that happened. So I was so much gratitude and so much humility because my clients, I had several very, very large clients would phone and say, what the heck's going on here? We have the relationship. Get yourself together and get this, get your business running. We need to keep this going. And so from absolutely nowhere, this whole business was built up, become the most successful business in South Africa in its market sector which I then sold four years later to move to Australia, which really set me up for life, basically. And I was 39 years old when I did that. So the message in that is when I got out of my way, the fear, well, in that case, I was, I was ripped out of my way and a big slap of spirit. But through so much gratitude and humility is that when you have nothing left to lose, you have absolutely everything to gain. 
And we built up, business partner and I built up a fabulous organization, which went and sold. And, and it was an amazing journey. This is just four years of building a company and then selling it. Um, and wow. I always so say to people, that sometimes sorry. you gotta reach rock bottom. The Nadir, Dark Night, the Soul. Yeah, yeah. It's actually Dark Night, the Soul. And I say to people in business and including this person today is don't go chasing the dollars because that is coming from a position of lack of um of scarcity if i have to go chasing money it means i don't believe there's enough money to go around i need to chase it get come from a position of service of gratitude humility and service and from that the light will shine through you and people be attracted to that and drawn to that and i had no idea about any of this stuff at the time of course this is all new stuff to me but yeah. somehow that's what happened and um, a friend of mine she kind of was watching me through this and said okay you're now ready i said for what you're coming to a spiritualist church with me. Let's go. And that was my sort of opening to all of that. And uh, so because of spiritualism, the company was successful, not despite it, because I then adopted those principles into the company. And the clients had no idea why they liked working with us. They just knew it was a cool place to work. Yeah. I didn't go around on a crusade, on a spiritual crusade, evangelizing, not at all. But I went on a crusade to give the best service I could possibly give. And they felt absolutely honored by that and they felt totally seen and totally heard and totally um present in what we we're doing for them i was are... just going to say that one of the things that uh seemed to set you apart uh from other people that i've worked with and everything else is that your ability to be so present present with what is and not have an agenda or uh, okay, we're going to do this or have something in your mind. You're just so present with whatever's showing up. Were you always like that? Or when did that <laughs> shift occur? You must be kidding me. Um, no, I was a complete idiot until about age 35 when <laughs> this crisis happened. It was all about me. Look at me, look at me. And I would say in those days, thank goodness, I didn't end up in the medical um, path getting diagnosed with anything. But had I been diagnosed, would probably been manic depressive, would have been called in those days, or what do they call it now? Um, bipolar, I think it's called now, or something like that. But thank goodness, I was too uh, arrogant and too afraid to go and have myself checked out in case I get discovered I'm gay. That's how terrified I was. That internalized homophobia was absolutely rampant. And you know, a lot of suicides happen in these conservative cultures because of that. So luckily I didn't go through that. Instead, I went through the what, what um, Stanislaus Groff would call from spiritual emergency to spiritual emergence. So when the why at the end of emergency was through that process, I understood the why. Why was I a spirit within such crisis, such emergency? With that clarity, with that awareness, I could remove the why and have better emergence. And in the spiritual emergence is when I recognize there is no separation between anything, you, me, the teacup, the plant, there's no separation. So the only way to be in that is to be totally present. And it, it just so becomes... What, what got you to that place of being totally present? Being grateful that I was alive. That the beauty of being alive, yeah, that I was actually still alive and um, that what others thought of me actually was not important. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, they actually couldn't give a damn. I was the one who was panicking. My internalized homophobia was so crazy. No one really cared except me. And I realized the talk and the discomfort and the pain and the suffering is all in here. Mm -hmm. Get that out of the way. And it's just as beauty. Yeah. It is a matter of seeing beauty everywhere. Yeah. When I came out of that dolphin experience and I saw all the beauty around, what, what I saw were all these boxes that I had placed myself in. Yeah. You know, like I have to do this, like I have to have this job and I have to do this. And, and you know, uh, I saw those boxes fall away. 
and um, infinite possibilities. To me, that's what the dolphins bring. So um, what do those boxes represent? Um, restrictions, like, you know, you have to live within this content. You have to, my, you know, my job has to look like this. Um, my income has to look like that. My, um, you know, it, it's like the American dream of the white house with the picket fence and the 2.5 kids and the dog, you know, this is how your life needs to look. And, you know, I didn't want to fall into that. That, well, didn't, I, that didn't fit me at all. Well, I, I don't think any of us wants to fall into that. I think we just are taken there without our even knowing it as youth. And that's part of the work I do around that whole path to freedom model in my book and that is um, we've, we've dropped into this place of conformity and compliance without even knowing it. We need to do it as children, as babies, in order to survive. If I don't conform to feeding time, I might just die. So we learn conformance and compliance as a survival mechanism. But then that, I think, gets totally manipulated to serve others and no longer serve our own needs, but serve others' needs. And that's fear-based conformance and compliance, fear-based manipulation. And we end up in that place, trapped, what I call the matrix. We're, sitting here, we're too scared to do anything about it because we actually believe that if we don't conform, we're going to get arrested or we're going to get rejected or something's going to happen. Look what happened the last four years in planet Earth. Okay. No, I was <laughs> definitely a nonconformist in the last four years <laughs> on so but, many levels. But look how the it's whole... like I'm not buying into this. this look at that but the grand experiment and how many people bought into it. Yeah. Uh, probably most are still unaware they've bought into something. They think this is all for their own good. Um, but a lot of people are waking up quite rapidly now thinking this isn't actually, this doesn't resonate so much anymore. Things aren't so cool, but they don't know why. And with time, hopefully enough will wake up and say, I want my freedom. I don't, this conformance compliance isn't working. So the point of that is that that access, the other side of conformance compliance, it, instead of being fear-based, takes courage to break out of that. Yes. And most of us don't have the courage, so it takes spirit to slap us to either nearly drown us or get us to feel really sorry for ourselves. Right. Um, and so it becomes that sort of courage. But that access that I call society's expectations of us, society expects us to have the picket fence and the nice house and the two kids and the dog and the cat and everything else. And the work I do is say, how do we become... Um, ambivalent to that but a healthy ambivalence not a screw you ambivalence but healthy ambivalence saying you know what if i've got that i'm going to enjoy it because i enjoy it not because i'm told it's the right thing to have if i don't have that because it's not what i want well that's also okay not because someone says it's a bad or good thing to have how do we reach that place of healthy ambivalence and follow what spirit is says is right for the individual for us well well the thing is and the, some of the work i do is like allowing people to understand that they have choices. Like people don't even understand they have a choice. You know, you have choice, you have freedom of will, you have freedom, you know, to choose how you want to live your life and how it looks. And um, that infinite possibility component is, it could look this way. It could look that way. It doesn't have to look like this one narrow focused way that you're imagining. And then you, the, it, the, the one thing that they hook you is they think you think that, okay, I'm going to have all that. And then I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. Right. Once, mm -hmm. So I'm working hard. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm doing everything yeah, right true. that I'm supposed to do, how come I'm still not happy? So the cons, well, the, the concept of freedom of choice or bringing it into people's awareness, what precedes that would be, I'm feeling this unhappy, or I'm feeling trapped, or I'm feeling suffocated. There must be something better. And that freedom of choice overlayers that well, there is something better. What would better look like for you? Well, 
this, this, and that. So what's stopping you? <laughs> and yeah. and that's that. And it sounds really simple. And like this lunchtime conversation today it sounds very simple, but there is so much conditioning and so much baggage and so much oh fear-based stuff going on there. But doesn't even people don't even know they're living in fear. Right. Yeah. When I when I was swimming with the dolphins and I had seen all these different parts of my life I realized how much I was living a fear-based life right and I really was. that's why I nearly blew, blew my brains out. I was terrified of what will people think of me I'm going to be rejected by family by friends by my company blah 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 so I created this whole drama and it was was a fulfilling prophecy yes I was rejected by a bunch of things but that was all my own doing of creating this drama and no one else really cared all they wanted me to do is behave myself and get on and do a good job <laughs> but but you didn't die you're still there. yeah you 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 survived you well it's an interesting it. point that i think in that in that and you will identify with this a big part of us actually does die in those moments it's that part which holds us in place of fear that part which prevents us from moving forward in those moments, that part dies. So that death to me is a wonderful death. So do you think when people fear death, it is that part, that fear that they're fearing more than that type of death? Than the you know, actual, like what we imagine death to be? Yeah, I think it's the fear of the unknown. And that is different for virtually everyone, how they define the unknown. Yeah. I think it's more the fear of the unknown and that's part of the whole Toltec teachings around that and they think the unknown is unknowable whereas the more one gets into this kind of work the more one claims that consciousness and goes on that path the unknown or what we think is unknowable becomes known more and more and in that there's and that I think is the goal of this kind of work is to find that place of peace because fear is only of the unknown otherwise why fear it if we know it we can make a choice mm -hmm. So people start getting a concept of death or concept of what happens life after death, if they believe that or whatever they believe, they can deal with that and prepare for it. Yeah, I heard uh, Zach, I guess last, you know, the famous Dr. Zach, yeah, talk about um, many times he's been, well, both times, whether he's there at a birth and he mm. looks into the eye of the child. Did you hear this quote? Yeah, it's beautiful. That so the whole monologue he did at the end of one of the interviews he did. Yes, and then the Bush. other one is um, the when people die and come back, mm -hmm. and how in their eyes he could sense that there is such peace and so much love and um, joy and and presence in that moment uh, because they've, they've come from the unknown, if you will, and, and mm -hmm. um, they're not afraid of it. And what I also have seen enough of, so I've kind of accepted, is that we can have multiple incarnations in this one physical vehicle, one after the other, that in the old days would incarnate and maybe the body would survive, what, 30, 25, 30, 35 years, then be killed off or eaten or stabbed or something in the old days. But with, the, with modern hygiene and the miracle of modern medicine, which is, does have its purpose, um, these things stay around for a lot longer now, which is quite handy. So, And also with the veils between this world and the higher vibrational frequency worlds collapsing, we're able to do our work a lot quicker if we step out of fear. We can get in, we can access those realms a lot faster. And so therefore we can do that work we came in to do, the incarnation, really quite quickly now. And then we have a choice. Once we fulfill this that life's purpose, that incarnation of healing, whatever it is, or healing family, feeling family codes, um, contracts, and so on, we can then choose, I'm done, I want to die, I'm out of fear. I've done that in case I get run over by a car or drowned or something. Um, or we can say, hey, I'm ready because my body is still healthy. I still have a lot of living to do ahead of me. I'm enjoying um, swimming and going to the parties and so on. I'm going to come and do another cycle of this. 
and I'm seeing people having several cycles within the same physical being and doing a second time around, it's so much cooler because we don't have to go through the birth stuff and the, being a child having to learn all the codes again and have to learn all the rules. We know what they are and we get so much wiser and we can actually do this work so much quicker. And so, so I'm really excited where we are in that we can actually claim that. It's there to be claimed. Of course, claiming that is a threat to those who want to keep us in the dark. And that's the challenge we have. We have to claim it and say, screw them. And so, yeah, so I've been around this probably two or three times now. And it's, you know, say my background's engineering. That was my first time around. You asked me anything what I learned at school. I haven't got a clue. That's, that life's gone. It shut down. It literally has gone away. So the past life and so on. And then people say, oh, it's just your memory's failing you. <laughs> <laughs> maybe but I, I have other wisdom now which who would have never have thought about when i was at college so what does that come from you know and so on so I, i'm kind of seeing it like that that we can actually have this gift oh that's that. beautiful and embrace and embrace modern modern medicine and a lot of people poo poo it only because it's been weaponized against us a lot of it but if we can be more discerning how we embrace it we can really right. have a we can embrace um, natural remedies and modern modern medicine. Oh yeah, I believe in traditional and holistic medicine for sure. I mean, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You want yeah. to uh, keep the information. The difference is that the discernment of when to. You still kind of have to be your own doctor, in the sense that. You know, they'll just prescribe medication and you have to check in with your body because nobody knows your body better than you do. And yeah. does this resonate or is this dosage too high or, you know, how is this feeling in my body? And, um, you know, not just take things blindly. And so, so when you say you have to be your own doctor, what you you're referring to here? <laughs> You, all you. <laughs> but the little disclaimer, I am not a medical doctor. I am not giving medical advice in any exactly. shape or form. I'm making suggestions only, you know, check with your physician. But it's... Um, My disclaimer is you have to at all times take personal responsibility and do not hand your power to, over to anyone, regardless of who they are or how many titles they've got or how many white coats they wear always take personal responsibility yes yes absolutely and you know there's benefits to both and so for sure you want to take that on uh i don't mind living many lifetimes in this body but i i want to i want it i want to be healthy at least had two, you know that i've had what you at least had two at least two yes probably more. yes yeah. And um, just going through the, if I am going to advance, I don't mind reverse aging. I'm totally game for that. And uh, yeah, I, I, I want to go through this process and this journey feeling healthy and, and re inv revitalized and energetic and, you know, having... Um, all the energy, uh, what one would think of as a 20 year old. No reason why we can't. Yeah, and it's, it's great that because I think, you know, when one comes in with a second or third time round, you're coming in with that beautiful, young, vibrant energy again, spiritual energy, and the body is going to respond. Yeah. It'll support it. If it, if it needs to support it because that's the soul contract, it'll respond. It'll make sure you get through this one as well. I find, and when I do this, the work that I do, the Reiki, the energy healing, the dolphin energetics, dolphin energetics in the ocean, whatever, um, however it shows up, or, you know, via Zoom, or that mm -hmm. it energizes me as well. You know, Absolutely. I'm totally getting the benefit as well, because the energy is moving through me onto yeah. the client. And so I'm, yeah, it's not draining when I'm Absolutely. doing it. It's it's definitely Absolutely. energizing. Yeah, and it's it's like that when you're on purpose, everything is a gift. Yeah. No longer work. 
So what would you say some of the benefits of spiritual work are? Either receiving or giving, just whatever comes to mind. I want to talk about the benefits and then some of the challenges. Because there's a lot of people in our community that are spiritual healers and on their journey. Some of them are starting out. Some have been there for a while. To me, the greatest benefit is inner peace is being in a place, you know, as that last scene of the first Matrix movie, I always love that. It's learning how to be in the world, but not of the world. In other words, fully embracing everything this world has to offer, not going to hibernation and running away, because I'm afraid. Fully embracing it, but not taking it on. Just watching it and watching this whole movie play out and watching this whole pantomime in many cases and watching the richness and the beauty and some of the ugliness and being absolutely in the world, but not taking it on as not of the world. And I find myself, I love people watching because of that and just watching the play going on and also figuring out where are these people from? Most people are not from planet Earth. And um, it's wonderful trying to identify and looking at them beyond the this mask, the skin we wear, this layer we stuck on ourselves. Um, and that's fascinating. Some of the challenges there, biggest challenge is to stop believing we are what other people say we are. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so to me, the it's labels. not. Yeah, the label. So to me, it's not about what do we need to learn on the spiritual path. It's about what do we need to unlearn on the spiritual path. We already are spirit. We can't learn to be spirit. We already are spirit. There's nothing to learn. What we have to unlearn is this fear-based human layer put onto us. We have to unlearn that. The rest is already there. It's unavoidable. It's it's not as it's you can't say, oh, if I don't do my spiritual work, then I'm going to be nothing. That that's impossible. That doesn't make any sense. You already are it. It's I have to unlearn the fear-based human stuff and just pull that off there. So this can now emerge because it's already there. It's nothing, I don't have to do anything for it except take a, take responsibility, personal responsibility for all this other layers and layers and layers of stuff I put onto myself. It's so interesting. So um, I play pickleball. As, <laughs> cool. I mm -hmm. love it. And um, so I was over there playing and there's actually a guy from South Africa. Right. That was my partner. Mm -hmm. And we were playing against two women and uh, these women were good. We've been playing for a while. And um, so there's a thing when you get to the net or what's called the kitchen, you can smash the ball if the ball is high. So this guy's a really good player. His name is Peter. He's a really good player. And when um, this woman, Tori, was smashing the ball at him, I mean, it's a wiffle ball. It's right. not like a hard softball that's coming at you. You know, it's a wiffle ball. It mm -hmm. could hit you. It's, but he would cower mm. from her and, you know, miss the shot. And I know him to be a really good player. And I'm like, Peter, what's going on? You know, why are you backing off? And, you know, and, and you know, it was, it was just interesting. And it played out a couple of times. And then the light bulb went on for him. And he said that he was triggered, this event was triggering a childhood memory of his because in South Africa, makes me wonder about South Africa, but anyway, it was, he was in South Africa, he would get beat once a week at least by his dad, like mm -hmm. beaten once mm -hmm. a week. I don't know what the circumstances, we can go into that. Right. And just playing pickleball and seeing that ball come at him, you know, he just like all of this came up for him. And it was still now this guy was older than I was probably in his 70s. Still yeah. and that's, that's very the real. trauma yeah, of it. his childhood upbringing in South Africa and was still dealing with it and still triggered by this event 
Now, the funny thing is, so once he kind of acknowledged that, and then he was telling the girls, and he was like trying to make them feel bad, you know, I don't think it succeeded, but it was just, we were just sharing. Once he acknowledged that and said that that was what was going on with him, the the fear subsided and he was able to play and we won the next game. But it was really fascinating to me. Those, to charges, are, those charges are absolutely real. Yeah. yeah. Was, um, what's happened in the last couple of years has triggered old ancestral um, energies I carry from Nazi Germany. From, against my family, my my grandfather was Jewish, so the Holocaust and this all this um, vaccination I shouldn't say that word on this channel, um, but um, the the protocols just triggered that this absolutely imposing control. You will do this, and the population we just had was like just overwhelming for everyone, and so everyone just kind of complied. And it actually brought up all that ancestral trauma for me, which I was carrying from my family, not my own direct life, my family's life. So that so, came up for you, or you said hmm, someone named Carrie? No, what well, it came up for me, um, because we were trying to do some energy clearing, in fact, this morning around that. I was holding a charge, and we said, What is this charge? We went through a whole process, and it came up. I was carrying that charge from my ancestors, from my grandfather and her fa and his family, my mum's side. My mum. Mm -hmm. It sits in so we carry these charges with us yeah um so not just of this life we can well not just our own but we carry the ancestral lines as well mm -hmm. and um and the beauty of this stuff is that when we know it we can clear it when we identify it we can but again i got I'm like a broken record here unless we take responsibility for doing it it's not going to happen unless we're prepared to say this has triggered me i need someone to support me I can't clear it myself, although you know, I do this work with clients, but I can't do it inside myself. I need other people to support me. So, but we have to step into that. So it's more the helping profession. We have a lot of helpers around us with our own helping profession and healing profession. So that was an interesting one today, just for me bringing that up. And it wasn't all, and whilst it was, I was raised in South Africa, I wasn't born there, but I was raised there. Um, for me, it was ancestral, it was my parents, my mother's side of the family stuff was triggered through what's happened the last two or three years yeah no it it it, it doesn't matter you know whether to childhood past life you know it, that stuff is still there and yeah. um yeah it's that's what i call the deep diving where we mm -hmm. go into the sub psyche and and you know get to the core issue of what is coming up and what is triggering and why it's triggering but, so do you, do you find in your work that it's like a, a, the onion, the layers of the onion, and what will be presented, I just took my own work, what's presented to me in clients is the thick outer layer, and the mm -hmm. guides will say to me, you're going to work with that and nothing else at this stage, because that is where the biggest issue to deal with. Once that's dealt with, the client will then choose, they've got free will, of course, personal responsibility again, whether they want to go any deeper or deeper, but it's kind of layer by layer gets pulled off. And only as much as the client can deal with, otherwise it becomes new traumas are developed. And you find the right. same kind of thing that you tap into the sort of most pressing issue to set them free. So they can then either choose to say, thank you, that was fabulous, I'm out of here, or let's do more. Well, it, it comes, I, I do find that life will show you where you need to go. Well, well, circumstances will bring things up and will direct you. And you have a choice again, whether you're going to look at it or you're going to ignore it. And then life will bring it up in some different way. And then... Hey Marie, on, on that one, how many people do you think are able to actually even go there because the trauma is there, you know, because our psyche protects us from trauma. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. They'll know something's our not ego. right. But our ego. Yeah, our ego, whatever it is. Keeping us safe all the time. Yeah, yeah play it safe. So I find what people say, things aren't working. I'm not sure why they're not working. I just feel really this or that or something triggered me, like on you say in the um, in the game, but haven't got a clue what, it, what that was, which is why I think 
in this these kind of professions that you and I are in is we had to create the space and the vehicle and the vessel really for allow people to go in there safely and explore it in a safe way with no judgment and without any um, constraints in that. Because I I'm fine when people come to me, they actually don't know why they're being triggered. They know something's triggering them. Right. But they, you know, my daughter said this to me and it really, really annoyed the hell out of me. I said, well, okay, under normal circumstances, that really wouldn't be a trigger. Let's have a look. And but that's for them, that's the trigger and that's it. But underneath there's all the stuff that the psyche to say is protecting them. Well, I think what's interesting is that we both have this engineering background. <laughs> and as this having this engineering background or, or th this inquisitive mind, like like even with this guy, like I know him. Like, mm. why are you acting this way? You know, mm. what is it, you know, why would you be afraid? Why are you afraid of this wolf and ball that's coming at you? I mean, of course, yeah, there's a bit of a fear, but like dramatically mm. acting in a way that is like, well, what to my attention and it's like so because your mind and you know this because we have this inquisitive mind we are going to ask the questions or we're going to go delve deeper into all right there we know that there's something here where maybe anybody else would just blow it off or oh he's having a bad day or whatever you know where we're not like that we're like wait why we we were always asking why why is mm -hmm. this happening why 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 are you reacting this way why 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 and the more you ask that why and this could be with a spiritual teacher or on their own the answer will come the answer will present itself you know you that you keep asking through meditation through guidance through assistance through healings the answer will come the answers will come mm -hmm. and yeah. um as you know maybe we don't want to hear what those answers are so we'll block that and that's when you need definitely somebody to guide you through that but mm. yeah yeah and what triggered me and got me into this process and i'll share it wasn't um being slammed with a shuttlecock whatever thing would you call it a woofer or something i was actually in a dentist chair having oh. and it was the drill and just having a crown removed and it just went crazy and I, I became wow. so stressed out that the dentist gave me the maximum allowable anesthetic and I actually became um, resistant to it. It, it my whole face and body was numb but not the tooth it actually said you've become you've totally become resistant I said I'm getting up and walking out and that was completely irrational behavior from what she's seen, what I've been through before, said, okay, this is not okay. There's something else going on here. So I took responsibility to find out what the heck was behind that behavior. That was the journey I went on. Uh -huh. and, um, and that's when this, all this came up, all these trigger points, what's happened the last two or three years in our culture, our society, and it just comes up. So, you know, I think, as you said before, we are constantly doing our work. It's never over. No. But, so, um, so, that, so that was was great work um a great practitioner but it's sitting there saying okay how do i take responsibility for that and overcome that fear-based behavior and that was ancestral wasn't even my own <laughs> yeah i mean definitely it was you know in the time of hitler and and else you know they they did do dental torture if you will well it wasn't around Maybe even dental that torture, was... but that was just a trigger point for the whole holocaust which yeah. the deep deep in my family that side of it so i don't want to go into that now it's not the time for it but yeah. that's but that trauma sits there and that triggered that trauma which was triggered by the events of the last two or three years here we're going through well it just so, shows you like there's, really interesting. there's no coincidence mm -mm. you know and obviously this is coming up now for you because you are ready to clear it you're right. in that place of, you know, you've done the work, whatever it is, and um, you're ready to release that. Energy. But on that, so we're having this conversation on that. My mother passed away two years ago. And the clearing today was releasing her and her family from the trauma they were carrying, which has put onto me.
was actually having to clear them. So this work, as you know, goes beyond just self, it goes into yeah. other lines. Absolutely. That, that, well, that was, we're all connected, you know, especially. Yeah. yeah. Ancestral connections. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, so going back to the work you're doing with the dolphin work and the unconditional love one receives from the dolphins and whales and how that opens that heart center in that space. And in that open heart center is when that whole connection takes place. Yeah. For me, it, it's all about the heart. Mm. It, that's all of our journey is just to get back to the heart. You know, if, yeah. we, if we can all be in our heart space, oh my God, what a world this would be, you know? Yeah. And isn't that the goal? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so so thank I you, Nigel, for your work and what you're doing. And can you share with everyone how they can reach you and connect with you? Yeah, probably the old fashioned way, which is the website. Um, and it's nigelbpatterson.com with the B in there. Otherwise, it goes somewhere else. Nigel B. Patterson. And the work I do is part of what I've explained here. Um, on helping clear people through a, a formalized processes because I've been an engineering mind and it seems to work quite well. And then also clearing negative energies, especially from external entities which have attached themselves to people and causing, in many cases, significant problems for individuals. Almost call it possession if you want to, um, in a way, but it's a more, it's kind of more subtle possession. And those are really the two main things I do I am also the author of that book, um, Return to Freedom. Um, Say so it's discover, rediscovering who you really are. That's on Amazon. So Return to Freedom, Nigel B. Patterson, it'll come up there. That, that book and that work was channeled when I was living in Hawaii on the big island at the uh, place of refuge. The kahunas brought that through. And that was published in 2018. I had no idea why. And they just said, shut up, do it, okay? And it's far, far more relevant today, having gone through this whole COVID crisis and the collective crisis, the planet's gone through and humanity's gone through, that what they brought through the guides then just makes so much sense today. I thought, wow, okay, that book was written for now, not even back then. So um, so that, that's- You that's were that, ahead of your time. That looks like, yeah, well, they were ahead of the time in pushing me to do this. And- um, and so, so that's kind of what I do. And I do it through Zoom or in person or in the astral or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Whatever is appropriate. I've been doing a lot of clearing in the astral, especially last year, year before last, a lot of clearing took place in the astral of some of the nasty stuff happening around us. Um, again, another conversation. So I'd wake up absolutely exhausted in the mornings until eventually I asked the guides, show me what is going on. And they showed me and it wasn't nice what we were involved in. I know I'd been trained for this from South African days. I know I'd been, and, and I never knew when I'd be using it. And I, I wasn't even aware I was using it until I said enough. So they gave me a break for about a month. And they said, nope, back into service. <laughs> so I think we put into service as we need to be. Sometimes we don't know it. Other times we do know it. It's just when we surrender, as you said earlier on, we surrender to God's will. Surrender to what spirit has in store for us. Surrender to what we chose to come in with, our kuleana. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time and uh, your energy and your vibration. And we'll have to have you back. Sounds like there's a lot more we could be talking <laughs> about. We'll yeah. get an update and um, yeah, we'll uh, see you on Level Up with Jean Marie. Thank you. And thank you for everything you do and keep up your beautiful work. Thank you. Oh, Aloha. Gotcha.